I wanted to talk this afternoon about wise and joyful effort in our practice. How, can, <clears throat> how we can be both wise and joyful. Uh, it's <clears throat> certainly hard enough to do our spiritual practice and I don't know if this is really true, but I, I want to think it's sort of especially hard in these times. You know, our world is pretty messy um, in all kinds of ways. Um, and so our practice uh, invites us, uh, indeed um, requires us, to cultivate a kind of fierceness and a steadiness of mind and heart in order to navigate uh, these uh, challenging experiences, these challenging times, and indeed even the challenges in our own bodies and minds that arise. You know, I loved the story uh, of, that Alma told yesterday about the ants, and um, that wasn't just, um, uh, you know, a simple thing that happened. Um, it wasn't like you just sort of go out and you, you know, go out into the next political rally that you, you know, uh, that, that you encounter or the next, uh, you know, um, riot in the street. And you just, you know, go out and you say, I think I'll have loving kindness. And then, you know, everything falls apart and nobody bites you. Um, that, that really isn't how it works. Um, remember that Amma started the story in talking about, was it tiger? Was it tiger practice? Mm -hmm. Tiger practice. So desert practice and, ti and then in, you know, tiger practice, this kind of effort, this kind of fierceness and steadiness of practice um, that was required in order to have both the, um, the stability um, and the composure and the kindness that, that really were brought to bear in that, in that circumstance. That was so awesome. Uh, uh, Diane Musho Hamilton has a, a, a book that she writes about working with conflict. And in it, there's a passage that I really love, and she, talk, she says something like, you know, we have to rid ourselves of the illusion that if we're going to work with anything difficult like this, that uh, we're never going to lose our composure. You know, that it's just going to be serene and sweet and tidy. And that, of course, we will lose our compo composure. Of course, we will mess up. It's part of the deal. And so we kind of cultivate this capacity to have uh, joy and wisdom uh, and steadiness um, in these difficult circumstances. Whether, again, whether the difficult circumstances are internal. We're sitting on our cushion. We look all very serene from the outside. And there are you know, 27 thunderstorms going on. Um, or, 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 or external. Um, so how do we have this kind of fierceness and steadiness with really any object that arises? Anything. Anyone. That's really the invitation of our practice. You know, bull ants. How do you do that? Um, It's, I just want to note, you know, so having this kind of fierceness and energy, uh, and I'll maybe mention this at the end again, is different from thinking that we can heal anything. You know, that if we just, you know, you know, practice enough, then everything in the world is just going to come out peachy. You know, and all those difficult people are just going to fall over <coughs> and think how wise and wonderful and holy we are. It, it's not like that. It's really part of wise effort is actually choosing uh, where to where to place our efforts. You know, uh, what's mine to do, and and indeed even what's doable given the present circumstances. What's doable, even the Buddha, um, in uh, some situations, uh, said, you know what, my efforts here are not working. Um, I'm going to leave. Uh, and I'll come back if things change. And I love you all, uh, but I'm just not going to stay here and try to, you know, beat my head against the wall and disturb my own uh, serenity when, um, you know, you, you're, you're not open to me, you're not listening to me. Uh, so the Buddha, the enlightened Buddha, 
couldn't fix everything. Uh, so, um, good, you know, we, we have a nice, um, a nice inspiration in that. So in this context, uh, wise effort is, is defined as an attitude of gladly engaging in what is wholesome with a, its function uh, is to cause one to accomplish wholesome actions. Wholesome actions of body, physical action, of speech, and of mind. So gladly and wisely engaging in actions that accomplish wholesome things, useful things. Um, classically, wise effort works in four skillful ways. One is to prevent the, un the arising of uh, unwholesome qualities in the mind and heart, um, uh, and to abandon those that have already arisen. Um, that's two. Three is to cultivate, to arouse those not yet arisen, wholesome state, and to sustain those that are already there. We've been working a bit with sustaining the goodness, really noticing and uh, addressing the goodness. I like to think of it as um, the Buddha says, do what helps and don't do what doesn't. You know? uh, so wise effort, do what helps, don't do what doesn't. Um, some balanced energy demanded by the task. Not too much, not too little. Directed toward freedom and ease. We can have, why, we can have all kinds of effort directed toward things like um, robbing a bank or um, destroying the reputation of our neighbor. So wise effort directed towards something that's wholesome. And wise effort that's directed toward the big picture, our long-term welfare, the long-term welfare of the world, not just you know, a real narrow, short-term um, uh, short moment. So balance directed toward what is wholesome and directed toward our, uh, you know, our and the world's long-term welfare not just a, a short-term benefit. And so the invitation is to inquire, what's the quality of effort? What's the quality of my effort in this situation, with this, that will accomplish those ends? Balance, wholesomeness, long-term welfare. What's the quality of my effort uh, that's both wise and joyful that will accomplish those ends? Um, in one of the suttas, the Buddha gives uh, a, the metaphor of uh, a servant who's cooking uh, for the king. And he, um, he cooks curries, and some curries are sweet, and some curries are spicy, and some curries are, um, I don't know what other, other kinds of things curries would be. Um, but there are all these different kinds of curries. And he says, a wise cook looks to see what the king likes what he eats, you know? What's, what's working here? And an unwise cook just keeps kind of throwing stuff out and doesn't regard how this is working, what's happening here. So wise and joyful effort, really looking to see um, what our uh, intention is and how is it going. And really just simply, what does the soup need? And with respect to our own practice, here we are on retreat, what does the soup need? Here, now, in this moment, given this quality of mind and heart, uh, do I need to be inspired? Does the mind need, and heart need to be gladdened? Does it need to be aroused, you know, kind of the energy aroused? Um, does it need to be uh, diligent and persevering? What does the soup need right now? And um, only, again, I would know. 
Does it need to be steadied? Does the mind and heart need to be strengthened? Does the mind and heart need to be encouraged and supported? Does the mind and heart need to let go and abandon something that is simply uh, maybe a, a long-term habit, but just isn't helping? It's not really what the king wants to eat. <laughs> you know, It's not making good soup. So right now, what does the mind and heart need? Can we taste our soup? In any given moment, can we taste what's going on here for me? And then pause and inquire what's needed here. I, my, my own practice was very steady this morning, and then this afternoon I was kind of tired, and the mind was kind of, you know, lethargic and agitated. And, you know, uh, that I, I realized that if I just sort of kept kind of making myself pay attention, that um, it would just be kind of drudgery for 40, you know those sits where you kind of just sit and you think, is it time yet, you know, is it time yet? Um, and so I did a practice um, that really kind of brought some brightness. Uh, we haven't talked about it, so I won't talk about it. I did a practice that brought some brightness and some clarity and some energy into my practice. Um, a kind of very formal practice um, that um, that had, I think, has some wholesome uh, outcome. But I just knew that if I just tried to kind of watch my breath, I would either fall asleep or get grumpy. You know, that at this moment the soup needed a little juice. <laughs> um, there are three levels of wisdom to cultivate. We've mentioned them a number of times. The first level of wisdom is just hearing the teachings. Um, and kind of just thinking about what it is, you know, that's, that's wholesome, what it is that's useful. So in hearing the teachings, the challenge is to hear and to listen and actually receive the teachings, to be available to the Dhamma. To not just hear them as words and phrases, um, or things that we know. Uh, don't you know people? I, I certainly do. I, I actually have a relative who is, quote, a Buddhist scholar. Um, um, and, <laughs> forgive me, it's really very tedious speaking with him um, because he gives me all kinds of sermons um, that are extremely in intricate and convoluted and philosophical, but that have no real re relevance either to him or to me or to, in fact, actual life. He doesn't really practice. He reads very, very esoteric books. Um, so it isn't that that is not useful in some ways. It's that if that's all that there is, if we're only reading books, if we're only listening to Dhamma talks, um, or mainly, and we're not really letting it, if you will, sink into us, um, it's really not going to have much impact. We're creating a self who knows a lot uh, and who can argue the fine points of the Dhamma. My dear relative sends me I made the mistake of asking him to read my blog one time. It wasn't pretty. He, um, he quibbled with a number of words that I used. I talked about being disenchanted. He didn't like, he didn't like any reference to being enchanted or disenchanted. Um, you know, so you, you know, there's this sort of like, you know, how many angels fit on the head of a pin kind of quality to it. But we can have that same quality about ourselves. You know? It's like, well, actually we can have the other side of that, which is, you know, really I don't know anything. You know, I can't practice because myself is uneducated and ignorant and I can't do anything. It's just the flip side of having a self who's inflated, having a self who's deflated, 
some of you have heard me say, probably ad nauseum, about the sign that Rodney King has over his desk with respect to that kind of self, the self who's no good. He has a sign that says, um, it's better to be wanted by the police than not to be wanted at all. You know, the sense of, you know, it's better to have a self who's just inferior and inadequate than to really have to kind of uh, investigate what does this sense of self and no self, what does this mean, how does this work in real life? So unless we relate wisely to our understanding of the Dhamma, it actually can kind of dig us into all kinds of holes. Um, but the invitation, the kind of wisdom, is to let ourselves receive the Dhamma. And again, that's the invitation as we invite you as, you, as we speak to not worry too much about you know, the concepts, but just kind of let it in and just see you know, what it is that kind of rings a bell for you. you know, what, where do you get interested? What's, what's useful? Um, so hearing it, and that second place is the place of reflecting, really kind of noticing when the bell rings, looking to see, there's something about that that's useful for me. Uh, and then reflecting a bit inquiring a bit. Um, uh, what, how, how does that work for me? What's interesting? The Buddha kind of, uh, the Buddha find, uh, wise, um, the Buddha um, uh, said, make of yourself a light. You know, we've heard that so much. He wasn't saying though, uh, make it up. You know, I'll say some words and then you interpret them however you want. That isn't what he was saying. What he was saying is, I give you the teaching, but reflect on it. Make, it, make of yourself a light. Reflect that, make it your own. What's true? How does it work for you in your life? How does it work? That without making yourself a light, the Dhamma is, is lifeless doesn't go anywhere. And the third that we've talked and talked about is the direct experience. Um, once you've heard it, knowing directly in your own experience and using it in your own experience. Um, when you know for yourself that something is true, you know how that works, you know, sometimes where you'll know something is true and um, someone will say, no it isn't, um, and, um, and, and you just know in your own experience it is. In my experience, this is true. Nobody else gets a vote uh, about whether or not this is true for me. And you know it kind of settles in you when you know it's true. It's not rigid. You don't have to go to war over it. It's just something you know. Sometimes we have that experience when we read, read the Dhamma or hear the Dhamma, we go, yeah. It's that place where um, in the suttas, um, the, the monastics would sometimes at the end of uh, the Buddha's teaching, they would go, you know, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. They would, and, or it, will say, it says in the suttas, it says, and they rejoiced. They delighted in, in the teachings. That's the place where the teachings just settled in and they went, yeah, I recognize that. That's your own being, that's your own goodness, that's your own wisdom. It's sort of coming forward to, to meet the Dhamma, that place where you know something is true. Or alternately, where you know something feels off. There's something about this that, that just doesn't work. And I'm not sure what it is. But there's some, you know, so that wise effort is really inquiring into um, how does this work? How does this work for me? What feels off? How does it go? So with all of that said, um, I wanted to just name a few qualities of mind and heart that I think um, are um, qualities that nourish and support 
wise effort. Um, the do what helps and the don't do what doesn't. Um, and so you might, as I go through the qualities, I seem to be into lists this week, so now I have a list of qualities um, in this talk. Um, as I go through them, just see if there's anything that kind of rings a bell for you. You go, there's something I could inquire into, there's something I could work with. You know, in terms of balancing out the quality of effort that I bring to my practice. The first quality is curiosity. Just being curious, being open to mystery. Any number of times we've touched into mystery. You know, being open to mystery, just allowing yourself to be curious, waiting to receive. May I be curious <laughs> about um, how I'm going to do this and how it turns out. I find myself curious with the Qigong practice. You know, um, sometimes I really don't like it. Um, and it's like, I wonder if I just keep doing it, what will happen? Yeah. Allowing ourselves to be curious. If I make the king this kind of curry, I wonder, I wonder if he'll like this. I wonder how this will go. It's not clear and I can't see what all the forces are, but I'm willing to show up and play with it, practice with it a bit, and see how it works. Can I be curious? Taste it, looking deeply. Um, there's a story that some of you have heard me tell that um, I heard a long time ago that Yvonne Rand, a Zen teacher, tells. And she says that she was uh, driving out, I think in Colorado, uh, on her way to a retreat. Somebody was driving her. And she passed a field that had a lot of sheep in it and um, several llamas in the field. And she asked the driver what the llamas were for. And, um, you know, why the llamas were there. And um, the driver said that uh, the llamas were guard llamas. Um, that uh, the coyotes and the wolves would come and they would attack the sheep. But what the llamas would do is that when there was some foreign animal around, the llamas would get really curious. They'd go, what's that? And they'd kind of go toward the coyotes. And they'd start sniffing around and and uh, checking out the wolves, and the wolves would go, I think I'll get out of here. This, this isn't a good place for me to be. You know, so I, I just loved that image. Obviously, it stayed with me probably for about 20 years, and I've told this story probably 20 times, because I just love the image of being a, a llama, being a curious llama in, um, in my practice. You know, if we kind of move towards something, and sniff at it, you know, <laughs> kind of just see what's, you know, what is this? Who are you? And what are you doing here? And what, you know, my anxiety shows up or my energy shows up or my irritation shows up. And can we move toward it with the quality of curiosity that a llama has? You know, this, this terrible thing that shows up in my, in, in, in my uh, consciousness, you know, can I move toward it with that kind of curiosity? All the, all the wolves and coyotes that show up for us. Um, so the, the quality of um, curiosity. Uh, another quality is the quality of confusion. Can we celebrate our confusion? You know? um, confusion is a place where um, we're right at the edge of something new. You know the confusion when you get your new computer? or your new iPhone, and you open the box, and you kind of go, I don't know how this works. I, or you start to make, you know, um, a, a spinach souffle, you know, or you start to, you know, um, uh, cultivate roses or something, uh, or you start to knit or something like that, or you start to play basketball, you know, it's like, how does this work? You start to even watch basketball, you know, how, you know, or soccer, you know. How does this work and why are they doing that? You know, it's, it's, it's right at the edge of the known and the unknown. Um, it's a wonderful place to be. 
Can we allow confusion and celebrate confusion? Uh, now, there are some things that are not useful to be confused about or even all that curious about. Um, why is my body like this? The Buddha actually taught whole numbers of, of uh, topics that he said, uh, you know, you can be confused about them, but, but it's not worth your time to investigate. They're not wholesome topics of inquiry. So why is my body like this? Why is my mind like this? Why were my parents the way they were? Uh, why is the world the way it is? Why am I so... Uh, it's really not so useful, for the most part, to inquire into those things. Uh, it might be a little bit, but fundamentally, we don't really know what was going on with anybody else. And it's not all that useful to try to figure out why my body or why my mind is doing this. Uh, the real inquiry is, how can I be with this? What's wholesome? What helps? What helps me come into a place of more serenity, more calm, more peace, more freedom, more stability? What helps me come into a, you know, a place that's wholesome of body, speech, and mind? Um, uh, when uh, Years ago, when there was the big tsunami in Southeast Asia, somebody asked Bhante Gunarantana um, why bad things like that happened. And he said, mm. in effect, you know that bumper sticker that says, shit happens? That's basically what he said. He said, just bad things happen. It's how it is. And so to try to figure out why the tsunami and why those particular people were caught in the tsunami is just not a useful inquiry. Nevertheless, some things are really wholesome to be confused about. How do I work with this irritation? How do I work with this pain in my body? What's, what's a skillful um, thing to do? Um, you know, should I, should I go on the internet now and read the newspaper or not? You know, can I inquire? Can I inquire and look to see? Um, I, I have trouble with concentration. What's happening here? Can I, can I allow myself to be confused without the confusion being a bad thing? You know, that the confusion is just part of the process of, of inquiry. There's a wonderful quote from Mingyur Rinpoche, which I love. I'll read it to you. Confusion, I was taught, is the beginning of understanding, the first step of letting go of the neuronal gossip that used to keep you chained to very specific ideas about who you are and what you're capable of, the first step on the path to real well-being. I think I like that because I love the image of neuronal gossip, you know, that place where our minds get so busy trying to answer the question, you know, of why my energy is like this, or my mind is like this, or why is this emotion here, the neuronal gossip <coughs> that kind of runs back and forth and it doesn't go anywhere. Mind you, Mingyur doesn't say that confusion is the final step. He says it's the first step. So to rest and delight even in confusion it's a doorway. It's, a, it's an entryway. Another quality of mind and heart is honesty. In one of the suttas, the Buddha gives a long teaching to his son Rahula about honesty. He says, before you do something, while you're doing something, after you've done something, in your body, in your speech, or in your mind, he says, look to see how it went. Was this wholesome? Did it lead to wholesome results? Did it lead to your affliction, to the affliction of others? Um, look and see, and be honest with yourself about it. Um, look and see what's useful and what's not. Um, Uh, 
Um, and if it's not useful, it gives you an opportunity to do something. To do something. To do something different. Um, if you regard everything that comes up, good or bad, as a statement about who you are and what your worth is as a human being, you're not going to get very far. None of us will get very far. So can we be honest and notice when we make mistakes, when that didn't really go very well, without it becoming some kind of judgment about our worth as a meditator or our worth as a, as a person, you know, that place where we kind of go, I must be a miserable human being if this is arising or if I've been unskillful with this arising in some particular way. Notice it, be honest, see it clearly, and then look to see what's needed. What's needed, what's wise effort, what will do what helps, and don't do what doesn't. What's wise effort? Um, another quality is patience. We sometimes think that things should happen quickly or that there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence. If I sit for, you know, one moment of loving kindness with myself, then that should clear this up, like now. Um, if I extend some quality of kindness to another person, then, then all of the difficulties in our relationship should just kind of dissolve right now and they should see how sincere and wonderful I am, you know. So a quality of patience. Um, I've had this um, conditioning now for 46 and a half years in my life, you know. It started when I was two. I'm only 46 and a half. Um, you know, it, it started when I was a little baby, this conditioning. And I've had this conditioning in my body, in my mind, for all these years. And I should do one meditation practice, and that should clear it out. Um, should fix all the neurons, change all the neurons, change how everything goes, and we're good. You know, It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Sometimes we have to have patience. We have to plant a seed. You know that silly thing we do in the springtime? You take this little package, this little white paper package that has these funny looking little things in it. And you go out and you put them in the dirt? Really? Really? And then you wait? Really? It's the same thing. If we kept turning it over, you know, turning the dirt over, looking to see how's it going, you know, that um, tomato that's ripening, how's it going, you know, the butterfly that's forming a cocoon. We, Shinzen Young talked about his desolation one time as a child that he um, cut open a cocoon, a butterfly cocoon, and what he found was this kind of slimy mess. And he was so sad that he had killed this butterfly, you know, that he wasn't patient. He didn't know to kind of, some things need to cook a bit. Um, we need to do the practice, cultivate what's wholesome, have some confidence that it's wholesome, and be patient. We can also see that there's such a thing, there's an idiot version of everything. There's sort of an idiot version of patience. You know, when that place where we're, you know, we're at the red light and it's red and it's a long red light and we're patient and we're there and we're patient and we're there and we're patient and we're there and, you know, 12 hours later we're still there and we're patient. You know, and at some point we think, well, okay, maybe patience isn't the strategy. You know, maybe this is a broken light and I need to do something different. So with our own practice, we can practice in a particular way. And again, what, what tells us the, the story is really if we kind of look with discernment and see, you know, I think I've been patient enough and it's really needing, it, it's needing something else, you know. 
you know, when we make a stew um, or a curry, you know, sometimes you have to kind of let things cook. And then sometimes you, th you know, you taste it and you go, you know, even though it's cooked a long time, it still needs something else. So, you know, all of these things need to play with one another. Um, but a quality of patience. Um, Upandita says, no matter how good your practice is, no matter how good your practice is, if it isn't done with patience, it's not going anywhere. Um, you know, it's like gardening yeah? or cooking or learning how to play basketball or soccer or how to canoe your canoe. Um, you know, if you're not doing it with patience, it's not going anywhere. You know that thing where you're setting up, the, you know, you're putting something together for your children on Christmas Eve? You know, and that place where you really have to be stern with yourself about being patient because, or when your computer jams up, you know, you have to be really stern with yourself about being patient because if not, you're really going to make a mess of it. Um, patience. And, uh, but at the same time, another quality is diligence. You know, kind of persistence, diligence, a willingness to kind of hang in there with it and getting the balance of that. I love the story you've heard me say, some of you. Um, I love the story about Michael Jordan, who I, I hadn't known. He was cut uh, by his coach from his junior varsity um, basketball team because he wasn't good enough. You know, I just love that story. Michael Jordan was cut from a basketball team because he wasn't <coughs> good enough? And what he did with that was he went to the coach and said, if I come to you for extra practice, will you help me? Um, and he did, and they did work together, and the rest is history. He worked really hard to develop the skill that he had. He had a lot of natural skill, but he worked really hard to develop. I think it's Pablo Casals who said, um, uh, if I don't, uh, if I don't practice for one day, I can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. If I don't practice for two days, my wife can tell the difference. And if I don't practice for three days, my audience can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to practice every single day. Every single day. Another quality is kindness. Um, we talked about maybe making this a whole talk. Now I'm going to give it to you in two minutes. The quality of uh, dealing with the obstacle of self-criticism, that sense of not being good enough. Do you know the stories about that? Um, the critical voice that's out of balance, because it, this is from Ajahn Suchito, he made a list, that drives, but it doesn't nourish pushes us, but it doesn't stop to say good work um, or good effort even. It sets unattainable goals or timelines, the critical voice that does that. Um, I should be able to help all people in all circumstances, everywhere, in all time, no matter what my personal resources and capacities are. How about that one? It's an unattainable goal. I should be able to rescue all of my friends and family from all of the difficulties that they experience. I should make myself perfect. Absolute thinking, the critical voice that does absolute thinking that, tell, that speaks in shoulds and nevers and always is, thinks in absolutes about yourself or other people that recriminates when we make mistakes, that calls us names, this internal critical voice that calls us names when we make a mistake, um, that predicts the future demise of your well-being because you've made a mistake, a general mood that sees how you are and what you're doing without love or kindness or grace or nourishment, that critical voice, 
the voice that says you didn't quite make it and you're not likely to. That critical voice. So releasing that critical voice, working to cultivate a quality of seeing clearly. The Buddha's advice to Rahula, see it clearly. See clearly whether the king is eating that soup. See it clearly. But release the critical voice. Release the critical voice. Another quality, experimenting in a sense of humor. In some, ha in some circumstances, we can be really happy with mistakes, can't we? You know, I think about watching my grandson take his first step. We were all at the beach together. I, I still, it I, makes me just like joyful inside to remember the moment where he took his first step and he was making a whole bunch of mistakes in the process. And we made, you know, there's room for those wobbliness. There's room for falling on your butt. There's room, you know, you make things safe so he's not gonna get too many bruises. Um, but the joy and the delight in allowing mistakes is a part of the path. And having a sense of humor about it and a sense of delight. Some of you may know the musician uh, John Cage, who's a jazz musician, amazing jazz musician. And he says, I try to be unfamiliar with what I'm doing. I understand that before a performance, he would go out in, I think, in the woods, I don't know, he had a piano in the woods or how that worked, but he would go out and he would play everything he knew to get it out of his system so that he could be unfamiliar with what was going to happen next. He said that when he was in um, music school, he was in graduate school, he would go to the library and he would see all his um, fellow students reading the same book that had been assigned didn't make any sense to him whatsoever. And so he experimented by going to the stacks and reading the first book that began with, uh, that, that was written by an author whose name began with a Z. You know, just like, can I just have a sense of humor about this and explore, experiment, play, you know, enjoy it, love it, see, What's new? What's alive? What's wanting to come forth? And um, the last one is um, one that I also could do a whole talk on. And the last one is um, sometimes it's a wholesome skill to run away. A wholesome effort to run away. Um, sometimes, in, actually the Buddha fairly explicitly spoke of this. Um, that for some, you know, sometimes when things just aren't working, when um, we don't have the resources, you know, I think I mentioned in one of the other talks, you know, that time when it's late at night and you're tired and you know that if you bring up that thing with your husband or your partner, that it's really not going to go well. Uh, and that really the thing to do is to withdraw and step back and recover your resources. Um, uh, you know, so to, st and, the, and the other thing that we've also talked about is those levels of, of um, five kinds of happiness that sometimes we get, you know, we, we get to concentration <coughs> and we realize that we can't concentrate because we actually have missed something at the first level. You know, we're, 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 we, we've missed the capacity of just taking in ordinary goodness. Or maybe we haven't healed something that needs to be healed. And so we start to concentrate and the anxiety pops up so strongly that it, that it pops us out. We can't, we can't really function. So to step back you know, from what we think we're supposed to be doing and to find what gives us enough nourishment so that we can bring some energy and some wise and joyful effort um, to what we're doing. You know, <laughs> joyful effort. The effort where, you know, where we're, we're learning something, we're doing something, and it's hard. You know, I think about when I was learning how to canoe. 
you know, and the rapids would come, and I'd be nervous and scared, and sometimes it wasn't pretty. Um, but we're learning how to do this. But it was also fun, you know, to learn how to do something new and to know that messing up and getting wet and muddy was sort of part of the deal, just part of the deal. It's not about being all that pristine and, and, and serious about it. This is a quote from Rilke. He says, there is here no measuring with time. No year matters, and 10 years are nothing. He's talking about being an artist, but in many ways we're artists too. He says, being an artist means not reckoning and counting, but ripening, like the tree which does not force its sap and stands confident in the storms of spring without the fear that after them may come no summer. It does come, but it comes only to the patient who are there as though eternity lay before them, so unconcernedly still and wide. So I could fill in all kinds of words there. It comes only to the diligent. It comes only to the kind. It comes only to the creative. It comes only to the people with a sense of humor. Um, yeah, it comes only to the curious. It comes only to those willing to be confused. You know, that it, it, it comes, but it comes with qualities of wise and wholesome and joyful effort. Rilke says, if you're wrong after all, the natural growth of your inner life will lead you slowly and with time to other insights. So you will grow and change with your practice. We've noticed that, haven't we? Even with a little bit of practice, we notice that we look back over time, we notice that there's a difference. Um, and I, finally, I, I would just want to point out the obvious. Um, that the difficulties, any difficulties with effort, with practice, with wisdom, with intention, with precepts, with levels, any difficulties that you have are just universal. All of your teachers experience the same thing. All of them. We do. Everyone you read, all of them experience the same thing. The Dalai Lama so kindly talks at times about his difficulties with the same thing. So that's not any different. What's different in what you hear in the teachings is faith. And, and the faith that comes from seeing the Dhamma work, seeing the practice work, seeing it unfold in one's life, um, the capacity over time to cultivate some of these qualities and to bring them um, to our practice so we're not just done in by it. Um, uh, so that's, that's the only thing that's different. So um, play with it. Enjoy it. Enjoy your cooking. Enjoy it. Thank you. Mm.